it is my honor to welcome the Honorable James Cleverly, Secretary of State for Foreign, Commonwealth, and Development Affairs of the United Kingdom. James Cleverly was appointed Secretary of State for Foreign, Commonwealth, and Development Affairs on the 6th of September, 2022. James was previously Secretary of State for Education from July 2022 to September 2022. Before that, James was Minister of State for Europe and North America in the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, FCDO, from February to July 2022. He was also Minister for Middle East, North Africa, and North America from September 2020 to February 2022. James was first appointed as a Joint Minister of State for Middle East and North Africa in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and the Department for International Development on the 13th of February 2020. James was Minister Without Portfolio from July 2019 to February 2020 and Parliamentary Undersecretary of State at the Department for Exiting the European Union from April 2019 to July 2019. He was first elected as the Conservative MP for Braintree in May of 2015. Thank you for coming to Israel. Thank you for coming to this conference. And thank you, United Kingdom, for being a loyal and good friend of the State of Israel. Gosh, thank you for that uh, uh, wonderful, wonderful introduction. After such a glowing introduction, I'm tempted not to actually say anything and to go out on a high. Um, but look, thank you very much for those uh, kind words, Jonathan, uh, of, uh, of introduction. And, and more importantly, thank you for inviting me to speak with you uh, here today. This, uh, this summit, the work that this summit is doing, is incredibly important, uh, not just to your country, not just to the region, but of course also to the United Kingdom, uh, and frankly, by extension, to the wider world, because countering terrorism, sadly, remains as much of a challenge today as it did when this university first dedicated an institute uh, to focus on it uh, just before the, uh, the turn of uh, this century. Uh, yesterday, those of you in the room joined countless others across the world remembering the tragic events of 9-11. Uh, it's in some ways hard to believe that that was 22 years ago. Um, but at that terrible time, almost 3,000 people, Americans and of course others, lost their lives at the hands of a brutal, vicious, unprovoked terrorist attack. There were 67 British nationals who died on that day and five Israelis were also amongst those who lost their lives. And it was one of those events, I am sure, where all of us remember exactly what we were doing when we saw the, the news. I remember I was in the commercial world. I was uh, in the publishing industry. I was a sales guy, sold advertising in the publishing industry. And uh, I worked on a big open plan sales floor in Soho, full of buzz, full of energy, uh, full of uh, excitement. And I came back from lunch and came up through the lift, came out onto the sales floor, big open plan sales floor, silence. The sales floor was almost completely deserted. Uh, and our sales director had a glass walled office right in the center of the sales floor so that he could keep an eye on all the hardworking salespeople during the day. And his office was rammed with people all staring at a television. And, uh, and I remember going in and saying, what's going on? What's going on? And someone saying, oh, there's been this terrible accident. A plane has hit uh, a tower block in New York. Um, and I said, well, you know, what is it? Uh, you know, some light aircraft, some kind of, you know, what was going on here? And someone said, no, the news says apparently it's a, it's a jetliner. And of course, with all the, 
with all the lack of information and self-confidence that someone of my age then uh, could muster, I said, that doesn't happen. Commercial aircraft don't fly into tower blocks. They're flight plans. That, that just doesn't happen. And I was in the middle of a heated argument about how that doesn't happen when we all watched live the second aircraft hit the second tower and all of us fell silent and I felt numb. And the feeling has never left me. And I think even at that point, before fully understanding the implications of what happened, I realized that that event changed the world and changed it forever. It is seared into our collective consciousness. And it was emblematic, it remains emblematic of the savage era of terrorism, ranging from highly organized attacks at one end of the spectrum through to what sometimes feel almost to be random acts of violence perpetrated by uh, individuals uh, who have been radicalized, whether uh, online or in their communities, and of course, every kind of threat in between. I was born and brought up in London. And like all Londoners, I remember, again, seared into my memory exactly what I was doing, exactly where I was, exactly what I was thinking when I heard about London's 7-7 bombing attacks, where 52 innocent victims met their death at the hands of Islamist terrorists. And of course, terrorists, we know, pursue a range of goals, and they, uh, they operate across the world. And their terrible attacks have plagued the lives of people across this region for decades. The sad truth is that violent attacks like this are nothing new to you and the people of this region. Only, only a few months ago, the UK and Israel were sadly united in grief following the horrific murder of British Israeli citizens Lucy Meyer and Rena D. And I've had the opportunity to meet with Rabbi D on a number of occasions, and his stoicism and strength is a genuine wonder to behold. But as everybody here knows, that is sadly not an isolated incident. It wasn't an isolated incident. And over time, the threats we face have evolved. But so, of course, has our response. And by acting together, by acting internationally, we have been able to reduce, although sadly not eliminate, the threat of terrorism. And our collective work and cooperation has saved countless lives. Terrorist networks are more fragmented than they have been previously. Most organized terrorist groups focus their activity now on whipping up discontent and anger and grooming others to act on their behalf. They target individuals who are already present in countries and try to encourage them to act violently on their behalf. But even if the terrorists' approach has changed, the fundamental challenge sadly remains the same. Terrorists still have capacity, serious capacity, to do us harm, and they are constantly, constantly looking for gaps in our defenses that they can exploit. Their methods, of course, have changed, have mutated, but their twisted logic remains timeless, whether it be Daesh, or Hamas, or extreme right-wing terrorists, or revolutionary Marxists. They all insist that their political goals matter more than the lives of their innocent victims. They, as well as their stooges, accomplices, and apologists, insist that their anger justifies the spilling of other people's blood. And that is sadly why they are so callous in their disregard for the sanctity of human life. That's why their logic stands in direct, glaring opposition to our values. And that is why the UK is unequivocal in condemning all acts of terrorism. And we have stood by Israel's side in the face of attacks this year and in the past, and we will continue to do so in the future. 
We have, in the UK, we have just prescribed the Wagner Group, whose attacks against the heroic people of Ukraine seek to advance Russia's political cause and whose brutal actions across the continent of uh, Africa have caused widespread uh, harm and horror there. And we call upon the whole international community to hunt the terrorists down, to bring them to justice and create a world where terrorists find no support. Because to tackle terrorism, we need the full range of tools. And the strongest of those, the most fundamental of those, is strong relationships. And I am delighted, genuinely delighted, <coughs> And one of the reasons I am here this week is to celebrate and publicize and shout about the strong bilateral relationship that the UK has with Israel. And earlier this year, you celebrate, celebrated the 75th anniversary of your modern, uh, um, uh, um, your, uh, your most modern, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> Independent. <laughs> the, uh, the 70th anniversary of your most modern incarnation. Um, and uh, Foreign Minister Ellie Cohen and I signed a bilateral roadmap to strengthen our close strategic partnership. And I am delighted that we are now also negotiating an upgraded trade agreement, that our tech hub has facilitated hundreds of innovative uh, partnerships. Uh, and some of you in this room I know are aware of this, many of you will not be aware, that Israel supplies one in seven of all medicines used in my country's National Health Service. So thank you for that as well. But I think nothing better illustrates our partnership than the work that we do together to keep our peoples safe. And I was uh, incredibly impressed uh, just a few uh, minutes ago, immediately prior to coming here, to be shown Israel's Iron Dome defense uh, capabilities, which have made such a vital contribution in saving lives and developing and deploying such capabilities is one way that Israel has been able to defend herself. But of course, as uh, famous and as visible as that is, it is not the only part of Israel's defense. Quieter, uh, more discreet, sometimes invisible, uh, intelligence officers, police officers, diplomats, uh, those who are uh, tackling illicit finance flows, uh, those who uh, 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 analyze and try and disrupt radicalization uh, online, all have an incredibly important role to play. Often, as I say, unseen, but nevertheless essential. And of course, much of this work, the majority of this work, relies on close cooperation, both bilaterally between the UK and Israel, and also as part of a network of other partners. And I pay tribute to all those striving in both our countries, day in and day out, to identify and stop those who would do us harm and undermine the democracies in which we both live. And sadly, it is not only terrorist groups who have this goal. These groups, as you well know, have enablers in the region. The Iranian regime has publicly and regularly called for the destruction of the state of Israel, something that the UK would never countenance. They transfer weapons around the, reason, they, around the region. They fund terrorist groups such as Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and these groups that attempt to rain death and destruction on the people of Israel. They fire rockets into civilian areas. They target children, 
and civilian infrastructure. They stab and they shoot innocent people of all faiths, of all nationalities, of all ethnicities, people who are doing nothing more than going about their daily lives in your extraordinary country. And Iran refuses to take responsibility for their complicity in these attacks. But we, in the UK, are under no illusion at all about Iran's malign role. And just as our strategic partnership means working together to stop terrorist groups, so too must we counter Iran's destabilizing actions in the region. But we must also be careful to avoid a council of despair because there have been so many wonderful, positive developments in this region. Because uh, last year, for example, in the Negev summit, building on the 2020 Abraham Accords, we saw light, we saw uh, positivity. And uh, just uh, this weekend, Israeli officials took their place at a UN meeting hosted in Saudi Arabia, alongside other delegations from around the world. I hope, we all hope, that the next steps in Israel's, uh, in the normalizing of Israel's relationships with its neighbors will carry us even further forward and even further along the path to sustainable long-term uh, peace uh, in this region. And we fully support the summit process, as well as all efforts to build regional architecture based on peaceful coexistence, greater understanding, and closer cooperation. And we will work with all of those to build on what has been achieved so far in pursuit of that sustainable peace. Because this will not only help us beat those terrorists that I spoke about, but it will also help us defend ourselves against the hidden backers of those terrorists. And on that subject, we must beware, we must be increasingly aware of the military cooperation between Iran and Russia, most clearly illustrated by Iran's wholesale provision of Shahad drones to the Russian military. And that is why all those like the UK that oppose Iran must do everything we can to help the Ukrainians as they defend themselves. And as we try to enhance regional cooperation, uh, we cannot, of course, ignore the uh, Israel-Palestinian uh, conflict. You will know that I feel there is no truck, there is no justification, there can be no excuse for the targeting of uh, civilians. But we do not need to share or endorse the twisted logic of terrorists to understand that a two-state solution is the best, perhaps the only route to a genuinely sustainable peace in the region. Tomorrow marks the 30th anniversary of the signing of the Oslo Accords. And this year we will also, uh, this year we also celebrated the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreements. Both were moments of hope. Neither were straightforward or easy to negotiate. Both required courage, imagination, perver perseverance, and demanded all sides to show the same quality to deliver lasting peace. In Northern Ireland, the shadow of terrorism has not completely gone. And of course, the troubles were not the same as the situation here. But what that example does show me is that the first step is always the hardest. And it is only by reconciling with those with whom reconciliation seemed unthinkable can peace prevail. And so that first step 
uh, would be for all sides, Israelis and Palestinians, to recommit and to demonstrate unequivocal support for a two-state solution. And it means that both sides must crack down on activities that flame violence and spread racism and hate. And that's why we come back here to the sanctity of human life. And of course, uh, we do need to uh, make sure that there is a respect for law. And I know that is something which I've been able to discuss here uh, with the Israeli ministers. And I commend Israel's taking of uh, uh, legal action against those settlers who have perpetrated uh, violence. And of course, we will always stand by Israel's right to self-defense. And the right to self-defense belongs, of course, exclusively to Israel's security forces who operate within the line of international law. And you should know that I will make the same point, the strong point, when I meet with the leadership of the Palestinian Authority. And I will make it clear that rather than spreading disgusting anti-Semitic tropes and outrageous distortions of history, they should be clear in their denouncement of violence. They should be clear that there is no acceptance for brutality and terrorism. They should be clear there is no excuse to target Israelis, particularly Israeli civilians. Because that is the only way that peace is possible, the only way for peace to be sustainable, for Israelis and Palestinians to come together and to work together and to fulfill the aspirations and hope that underpinned the Oslo Accords. And I am not naive. And I know that these are incredibly challenging goals and that they are exceptionally difficult. But I've also seen this country firsthand. I've read much of this country's history. And one of the things that has always amazed and impressed me about Israel is Israel's ability to seemingly do the impossible, to survive in, in the face of seemingly overwhelming odds. The 75 years of your continued existence is proof that this is a country that can do amazing things. You have stood as a beacon of liberal democracy in the Middle East. And you have proven to be a great friend and a valued partner to the United Kingdom. And that is why I am and will always be and will always be proud to be seen as a friend of Israel. Now, those of you who have known me speak publicly before uh, will understand the limitations of my ability to speak foreign languages. It is famously poor. My Hebrew, it says here, my Hebrew is limited. That's a generous interpretation. <laughs> but my good wishes to this country are severe, are severe, are sincere. <laughs> my Hebrew is going to be severe. I'm just getting, I'm building you up to this. But my good wishes are as sincere as they are heartfelt. And this is, I've been trying to avoid this moment, but give me uh, a, a traditional uh, a, a Israeli warmth for my terrible Hebrew. Shana tova v'hakshamash. Toda Is that right? <laughs>